All right, there we go. All right, welcome to the bogus edition of uh, Legal Tech Week. This is the uh, it's uh, this is the show in which we talk about the top stories in legal tech and innovation for the week. It's June second, two thousand and twenty three, uh, and I'm Bob Ambrosi. I have a blog called uh, Law Sites and a podcast called Law Next and a legal tech directory. If you need one, called Law Next also. And uh, our panelists today, uh, we can start with the birthday celebrant, Nikki Black. Happy birthday tomorrow. Oh, how did you know that? Thank you. Oh, like, geez, <laughs> nobody knows anybody's base birthday is anymore. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, my name is Nikki Black. Um, I am the uh, head of SME and external education. My title may change, and when it does, I'll let you know. At, um, <laughs> I think you may like what it changes to um, at my case and uh, La Pay. And um, I write legal tech columns for AVA Journal, Above the Law, uh, Daily Record, and other outlets. And I also oversee the My Case and La Pay. Um, and I author the industry report and benchmark reports. And um, I'm really looking forward to celebrating my 20th birthday tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Wait a minute. What do you mean? Your title may change, and we're gonna like it. You don't know if it's gonna change, or I think it's going to. It just hasn't happened yet. Oh, okay. So it like has to, has to go happen. through the uh, get the paperwork done or something. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> All right, uh, Stephanie. Uh, hopefully, your title remains the same for a while. As far as I know, uh, Stephanie Wilkins, editor in chief of Legal Tech News at ALM, and that is and... all. <laughs> Okay, Joe. Uh, I am the legal industry archduke of, no, I, uh, I'm i Joe Patrice from Above the Law and Thinking Like a Lawyer, the podcast. And yeah, no, I'm looking forward to, I, I still have never liked Nikki's title after it ceased to be evangelist. So I'm hoping it's something fun uh, on the next end. Yeah. It just may revert a little bit. So maybe everyone will be happier once it reverts. But I, I like the Archduke personally. I think that was a good one. You should stick with that. All right. And Gene O'Grady, what's your title this week? The goddess of knowledge. No, <laughs> the, uh, I'm the publisher of Dewey B Strategic and I write a column for um, Legal Tech Hub. All right. Well, uh, you know, we have to talk about it this week. Uh, the, uh, the the bogus cases case. Uh, uh, as Stephanie and I were emailing this morning, uh, poor Stephen Schwartz has become the I am not a cat of the generative AI era, I think. Uh, and uh, but but it's but it's really actually it's really kind of different because the, the the poor I am not a cat guy. I mean, that really was just like a I don't know, a fairly innocent mistake, I guess, whereas this this situation, and I, I'm sure everybody knows what we're talking about with with the the two lawyers who filed a uh, filing and, and Stephanie's got her cat face on. Or is that a cat? Is that a tiger? I was trying to it's find like it. Tony the tiger. I, it's a really, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to find a cat. Sorry, go um, ahead. <laughs> I didn't know we could see it already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, this is the, the two guys who, who filed a case and they filed a paperwork in, in federal court, which they were, they cited a, a number of cases. Uh, and uh, opposing counsel said, well, gee, I can't find any of those cases. And the judge said, well, guess what? It looks like uh, they were all made up. Uh, and uh, now uh, these lawyers are facing sanctions, possibly uh, facing, at least one of them is facing a possible uh, referral for disciplinary action. Uh, and, you know, and, and not only did the lawyer file these case citations that weren't real, but then backed it up when the judge said he wanted proof by filing these bogus text opinions that he got off of chat GPT. And, and, and when, when somebody questioned, when the judge questioned the veracity of these cases, apparently the guy went back to chat GPT and said, yeah. were you lying to me? <laughs> and chat GPT said, would I lie? Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know what the moral of the story is exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just so many, well, I think we've all agreed. This is not a tech problem, it's a lawyer problem, but there was just so many failings at so many levels. Like, yes, use ChatGPT, 
but then used it to make the fake cases and then asked Chief, chat GPT, are these real? And then just went with it. Like, it's just. Well, what I want to know so, is how do you know about chat GDP and not know about shepherds? I mean, there are so many, <laughs> so many technologies that have been around for decades that would have shown him he was going to have a problem. I mean, that's what's astonishing. And, you know, part of my day job is to make sure lawyers get trained. And I have to tell you, every time I have introduced a new legal technology that appears to make legal research easier, I always practically plead with them. This doesn't mean you don't need to read the cases. You still need to read the cases, even though it, it you know, brief checkers, everything makes legal research look easier, but it hasn't gotten, it hasn't taken away the need to read the cases. And I just want to point to, I also have a theory. Years ago, when I first started my blog, I wrote a, a post that cited a book by Nicholas Carr called The Information. And he wrote an, an Atlantic story called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And it was really about how a generation of people who grew up reading the internet can't really read, they can't even process large amounts of information because their brains have been changed. Is that, well, is that what's happening here? And, and what to say for the future? I mean, if lawyers need to be replaced, this is good evidence that they do. <laughs> well, except that one of the things I pointed out in my in my post is that even if you just Googled it, you would have gotten yeah. accurate results. I mean, if you just taken the case name and dropped them into a Google search, right. you, you, you know, you would have basically seen that it doesn't come up anywhere. And right. you would have, I mean, that would have Not, reason been reason enough to question it. But. And he no, clearly no, didn't no, jeopardize no. it to find out if these fake cases had been overturned by another fake case. Well, well like and, that, and that's tools. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's that's part of the issue too. Like, even if you aren't going to read it, you at least have to make sure there's not a red flag standing next to it. Uh, but uh, my one of the things I said, and this is kind of beyond just looking it up, just kind of litigator trick. Uh, when this case, for those who weren't who don't know the underlying issues, uh, it's a lawsuit against an airline. There's questions about international treaties because the Montreal Convention is involved, but it's overlapping because the company was in bankruptcy at one point, and now there's a motion to dismiss based on the statute of limitations. And was that told? And does the international treaty over uh, have any implication with the U.S. bankruptcy code? And he found a entire page worth of a direct quote from a alleged 11th Circuit opinion that spoke to this hyper-specific issue. Uh, that was the red flag there. Uh, if you're finding a case that deals with your completely bonkers set of facts directly on square, that should have been your first indication there was a problem. Uh, yeah, no, I think, yeah, we've we've all kind of said it already. This is not a tech case. This is a just good lawyering case. Uh, and that's why my complaint about it has been... Uh, that it's a legal industry somewhat and mainstream journalism problem more broadly issue. Why are we having articles trying to clickbaitily say that this is some sort of a chat GPT lawyer? What goes wrong? I think New York Times was like, what goes wrong when you use chat GPT? It's like, well, nothing when you use chat GPT. What goes wrong is when you're an idiot and don't look at your cases. Uh, but that's that worried me because I think there's there's a problem when we think that the when journalists, not us, but bad journalists out there, think that there is traffic to be had and audience share to be gained by villainizing, uh, villainizing, yeah, that vilifying uh, this technology. Well, yes, I completely agree. But I mean, what we've been seeing in you know non-tech centered media this whole time is that they just don't really understand the tech. So whether or not it was purely a desire for clickbait or they really were just like, oh, chat GPT lawyer, let's do it. But it's just like, it is really distressing because they're spreading that. And then also we were talking in the green room before we were, got, got on here. So like, even in us posting these things that are very clearly like, this is not a tech issue, it's a competence issue. We're still getting comments on our posts being like, like I had one being like, oh, I guess the moral of the story is that if you use AI, you go to jail. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I did. I just waste how many hours, like, writing something to you, like, not even read the headline? I don't get it. Yeah. Well, one thing about it that I'm what I, I feel like I haven't heard anyone talk about, and I haven't read every single article, so maybe someone has. But 
what I think this is, is like a supervisor issue. I wouldn't be surprised if the initial memo was something that an associate prepared. This is, it looked like it was a fairly, no, it's not an associate. I don't think so. I mean, maybe, maybe. but it appeared, it appears to, to be a lawyer who has, who's very experienced, uh, like 30 years of practice or something like that, who had a state case. And then it was sent to, it got removed to federal court. And so a different lawyer actually has their name on it. Uh, but the underlying lawyer who did it seems to be a, well, I mean, was, he's within a firm, but seems to be functionally a solo practitioner is within that firm. Uh, well, well, doing what is this. the last time? It is a, the it lawyer. Is a, it's a oh. supervisory issue for sure, though, because like the, guy, the reason co counsel had to get on there is because the state court lawyer was not admitted in SDNY. So he needed somebody from his firm who was. And so the co counsel who was SDNY is also facing sanctions now, even though the guy who did it did step up and say he had nothing to do with it. I did it entirely myself. But they're both facing sanctions now. Well, the lawyer filed an affidavit saying it was him who did it. He, he, uh, uh, I'm trying to find exactly where he said, but he's, he, he, yeah. he says, lays out in his affidavit that he went to chat GPT and did this as a, uh, what did he say? As a, uh, your affiant consulted the artificial intelligence website chat GPT in order to supplement the legal research performed is what he said. Well, so uh, a source which later proved itself to be unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so even All right, two two people used air quotes simultaneously. We we should be kicked off the internet. I know. <laughs> we need to also let Nikki talk. <laughs> well, what this makes me think about is, you know, and I was an associate in the law firm for a number of years. Um, I, I can say with a fair amount of authority that I don't think I, I the vast majority of partners did not write their own memos. They didn't write their own, even you know the affidavits that supported the memos. Even like often it was always, and I'm not saying that's the case in this case. Um, since it's pretty clear this from what you're telling me that what, uh, from that affidavit that this guy did it himself. But typically from a supervisory point of view, when, and I don't want to like throw other lawyers under the bus, a lot of them are retired anyway, but you know, a, an associate would get hired, you'd write a couple of memos, they'd look through it, they'd, they'd see if you did a good job and if you were thought well and they could rely on you. And then I'm, I can almost guarantee they didn't pull every single case for every single memo I ever gave them. They relied upon me um, assuming that I'm competent. And I think that this is a, really this, a similar thought process here, that there was a reliance upon ChatGPT, a mistaken reliance that it was competent, um, and it's not. But even so, I, I, it's sort of our supervisory lawyers, you know, the partner on a case, are they truly, do we think they're truly required to pull every single case, read every single case, find those subsections that are being referred to, especially when you've got seven case sites sometimes just to really hone, make, hone in on your point and make the point that a lot of people said this or whatever. Do we really expect them to read every single case that an associate gives them? And if so, I, you know, obviously you got to do that with chat GPT, but if not, at what point do we rely on artificial intelligence if it gets good enough that we don't have to double check those and read the entire case? Do you think we'll ever get to that point? Well, I mean, there are tools now that you could use to at least do the, you know, what we, what used to be shepherdizing or whatever, if you don't want to read every single case. I think the bigger, and I totally agree with you, but I think it just gets more and more egregious when like, even say he was clueless, say he was whatever. And then by the time there's letters to the court being like, we don't think these exist, wouldn't it clue you in to maybe use something other than ChatGPT? He just went back to it three times as the only like confirmation loop. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I 100% agree that this was absolutely egregious. At this stage of this technology, there's no way anyone should rely on anything it says. It's, li li it's like a bald-faced liar most of the time. And it's an asshole because it says it in such a nice way. You know, you think it, it makes it sound so good. It, it will give you entire cases that with fake state sites with entire cases to support it. You know, it, it goes into a hole. Like it does this like deep dive to support its stupidity. So if no one should be relying on it at this point. But I wonder at what point, the AI is going to get better and better and it's going to happen quickly. And like at what point, and when you're using legal tools, maybe not chat GPT specifically, right. but GPT powered legal software, I, I'm just going to pull one out of the air because I'm, I'm not saying co-counsel does this, but what if co-counsel gets to the point where you are going to be able to rely <coughs> on anything? Do Excuse you, or does your supervisor but, responsibility re re require you to really pull the cases and read every single one? But that's already happening with Lexus and Westlaw. It's been happening for decades. Westlaw started out writing headnotes over a hundred years ago, and lawyers relied on the headnotes. You know, so it, it's it is 
it, you know, the problem is that people are, or this guy in particular, didn't go back and do anything to validate or didn't even, somebody didn't even attempt to see, read the cases. I, I don't know. It, it, oh, it, it, Co-counsel does that now. Co-counsel, when it gives you an answer yeah. in chat, it shows the cases right next to it that support and, those answers. And so it's all there. And now and you can so question, the is, are, are the so cases all, real that are in? Yeah, you should read, I mean, you should read the cases. And right? so, right. well, the commercial brief checkers and, you know, CARA came out over six years ago. All the, all the commercial services have a brief checker that underscore and create links to all of the cases cited in a document. Yeah. You, you would have a list of cases that had no links and no citations, you know, but I, I, I just, mean, I'd be way more concerned uh, from a litigation perspective. I'd be way more concerned that things are being left out that aren't being properly looked at than things are being put in. Because at the end of the day, how many cases are you fitting into that page limit? Like at a certain point, it's it's like you can you not not read 20 cases? How many pay cases can you yeah. fit in that? Uh, unless, you know, maybe there are indulgent judges uh, who should not exist, yeah. who let you write 150 page briefs. But assuming you're writing a 25 to 30 page brief, there's not enough cases in there that you really can justify I didn't bother to read them all. Uh, the the <laughs> making a mistake by exclusion seems like more of a risk long term, where you didn't read all the cases and therefore missed the best one, or the problematic one, but whatever. In this case, didn't he read the cases? He thought he did. He just got the cases from ChatGPT. He had the full text and he filed those with his affidavit. He's yeah, the cases it created the decisions that he yeah. read. So it's, I mean, that's, yeah. So, so once again, the, the lesson they have. Well, no, the lesson it's, here is that Westlaw and Lexus need to lower their fees so that people are <laughs> able to access them more. Or use any of the nine million free right, access right. points yeah. out there, with Google, case Google case Scholar, or whatever case. else. Right. Well, you know the other. <clears> thing I mean, what I... the, doesn't it seem like there's something suspicious here? I, I, I mean, again, he's he, they don't spell this out in their affidavit in the timeline about how he went from just having these citations to then getting called out by the judge to then suddenly producing the text of these cases, well, so and it, it to well, me that seemed are you a little. Somebody wrote them? Well, no, the un well, no, I think ChatGPT did, but I think is, subsequent. Like, so, say so the the case was like you know Wilkins versus New York. He mm -hmm. that he had generated. He went back into ChatGPT and was like, "Here is this case site you gave me. Give me the underlying decision." And it spit out a bunch of stuff that looked like. But even in one of the affidavits, it said sometimes not the full decision, but the portions of it that were available on the public database. So yeah, it just right, right. Yeah. So uh, so this guy's understanding the tools and what he should be doing. This guy's coming up for sanctions hearing June eighth. Is it a yeah? yeah. So do we, anybody want to put money? <laughs> what what's going to happen? Well, well, you know the the other issue it it touches on is years ago there was a movement in AALL to try and get legal research competency added to the bar to to the bar exam. And you know, I, I mean, I I do actually think fundamentally this is this is a a failure of research skills. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're generous. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, he could have. I don't know what search he put into ChatGPT. If he put it into an actual tool, maybe it was the right search. It just wasn't no, actually but, accessing no, law. No, no, no. I'm going back further. Of you find the case, you shepherdize the case, you make sure you validate that the case exists, you know. Yeah, like uh, you're absolutely right. And I haven't yes. read this specific um this specific is Google making a stupid article uh and it might be the one that I'm thinking of vaguely. I haven't looked to check to make sure, but there's definitely been some scholarly research on the generation that grew up with Google not understanding the concept of research in the way that we do. And I see it with my students uh, coaching debate stuff, which is very research intensive. They'll they'll type into Google a question like, where's this, whatever. And if it doesn't give them the results, they'll think of a different question to ask Google. And I'm like, well, or you could go to a library or you could think of 
a journal that exists that talks about that issue and maybe go look at that journal and maybe you'll back end your way into new turn. They, they start at Google and if it fails, they view the problem as them for being bad prompt engineers, which is really scary. Oh, there is an app for that now. There's a plugin, a GPT plugin to fix your prompts. So well, soon we'll and that's the thing. <laughs> I said this, I got in this argument on Twitter the other day. Somebody was talking about like uh, how uh, Google's trying to make generative AI write these summaries and how that's ultimately fault the first searches, which is ultimately folly because people don't really want that, which I think is true. And I think the ultimate Google play, the play in search is to use generative AI to be people's prompt engineer because that's where people actually need it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, it would have been uh, it would have been a good week for somebody to write about the ethics of using chat GPT or some of these other tools. Um, did anybody happen to do that? Well, uh, I, in fairness to, uh, I think that would be me, right? Um, I think that would be you. Jean also yeah. had a start. She yeah, didn't do I'll, it. But the, I'll yeah. let oh, <clears throat> you want to go, no. Jean? No, 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 no. You, you, Jean, you, you Jean didn't write one. She cited one. Oh, you wrote yeah. one, so you can go for okay. it. Okay. Well, and I want to just say in fairness, <clears throat> I did write about the general um, best practices and ethical considerations, but um, I linked to Mark Palmer, who I see is in the audience. He wrote a really great blog post that was very thorough, focused solely on ethical issues. And so for, I did a general, over, like a one paragraph overview of ethical issues and said, just read his post. So, <laughs> but um, what I, uh, it's a great post. So it's definitely, uh, you should read that. But um, I essentially, I wrote about this because somebody on LinkedIn um, said, suggested I write a post just on best practices. Um, and it was published right before this whole debacle, um, a day or two before it all broke over the internet over the weekend. Um, and essentially I, cause I think what, what happens when we write about this, at least when I write about it, you got a six to 800 word limitation. You're trying to say like, this is what chat GPT is in case they don't know what it is. Um, this is how you access it. Be careful with, be careful. And then here's the plugins or here's the browser extensions, or here's some other context in which I want to talk about it. And you kind of, um, I gl will gloss over the best practices stuff just because it would, it's literally an entire blog post just to write about ethics. So in this one, I still glossed over the ethics a little bit, but what I did talk about was <clears throat> understanding the risks, benefits, and best practices um, included some examples of what you really can use it for. I think what it's best for is drafting documents, forms, and templates, summarizing things, um, analyzing contracts, especially if it's an illegal specific functionality within some sort of software, um, litigation preparation, by that I mean brainstorming questions for voir dire or cross-examination about a very specific point. Um, <clears throat> and you can do those things, but if you're going to do those things, you need to keep confidentiality in mind. Make sure um, to A, turn off the prompts if you're using ChatGPT, the prompt storage, um, so that they don't save your conversations. But also still keep in mind that ChatGPT is not, uh, you're not going to get the same confidentiality um, uh, commitments that you're going to get from legal vendors. So you need to think about that. And if you're going to ask um, them to provide you with information, you may need to uh, edit the document you want summarized or ask a question, but leave all the client's confidential information out of the question, but still have the fact scenario being analyzed for whatever purpose you're trying to use it for. And then again, I talked about the legal ethics like I talked about. And um, essentially, it's confidentiality, but there are other issues like supervision which I think was really a big one with the um, debacle over the weekend. You know, it really, for me, it was competence, which required supervision. It was really those two different, um, you know, supervising the technology that you're using and understanding it and understanding that it does provide hallucinations. And then the art of the prompt is important, which is what Joe just touched upon. And there is um, a tool called Perfect uh, prompt perfect, but um, it's a standalone tool, but it also has a plugin. So if you have chat GPT plus access, you can add it as a plugin and it can create the appropriate prompt. You tell it what you wanted to say, and then it will create a better prompt of what you want to accomplish. You tell it and it creates a prompt and then feeds it to chat GPT. And if you have the plugin, it just will do that automatically so that you can get better output from chat GPT. You can also use that prompt perfect standalone tool to use with other search engines as well. 
or types of things where you have to enter queries. And then I just talk about hallucinations. We all know that. Don't get fooled by the hallucinations. And um, I think it's just really important. I was glad that I wrote about that and that it ended up being timely because I think it's super important for lawyers to keep all these things in mind. It's a new tool. It's improving rapidly. I think that in a very short amount of time compared to what we're used to. It's going to be built into these legal products. It's going to be reliable. A lot of the issues are going to be um, uh, non-issues, and you're going to be able to rely on it a lot more. I just saw today, and I'll, then I'll stop my little um, oration here, um, that OpenAI is doing significant research to reduce the hallucinations. And one way that they're doing that, um, they wrote a paper. They proposed that instead of um, having like what now, right now, what they sort of analyze is the outcome instead analyzing each step of the process so that they don't end up going down these crazy paths that lead to this, the re requested outcome. But when they get, when it gets at a certain point where it doesn't know the answer, make it stop and ask for more information or something rather than fill in the gap so it can get to the requested outcome. And that sounds like they're trying to sort of make it have steps in its process rather than just focus on the outcome and hopefully get rid of some of the hallucinations. So I think that's interesting. They're already coming up with ways to reduce them. And uh, I think it's gonna very quickly, this problem will be solved. I have a question about this perfect prompt tool or whatever it's called. So ChatGPT understands what you're trying to ask enough to tell you to give you the the right prompt to then give you the answer? Why doesn't it just give you the answer if it understands what you're trying to ask? Well, because it's, it's you know not- what I mean? Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. But the thing, the, when they talk about prompt engineering and why people are getting hired as prompt engineers, it's like actually a position yeah. that is getting paid six figures now is because when it's really, you get rushed and you just sort of type, tell me what X is. <clears throat> but really you need to say, you are an expert. So let's just talk real estate as an example. You know, um, you want to know how much a property might be worth. You are a realtor and you're an expert in property valuation, yeah. you know, to give it the context. And this is the goal I'm trying to get. Here is the contextual information that you need in order to um, provide me with the information. And sometimes here's a website if you use a link or something, um, if you're using a plugin that will go to a link. And here's a website that has a lot of that information or something like that. Okay. that it takes a long time to type all yeah. that, provide all that context. And so what um, Perfect Prompt does, and I have the plugin, you can either use the standalone enter your query and it'll give you an output you can copy and paste in there. Or else when you use the actual plugin, when you have ChatGPT plus that has plugins enabled, which most people who pay for ChatGPT should have at this point, you check the box that says perfect prompt. And then you say, prompt this is perfect, what I right? want, you know, okay. I want evaluation on this property and perfect prompt then <clears throat> creates that whole sort of longer thing. And sometimes it will say, I need some additional information in order to provide the appropriate prompt. Like, what's the address or, you know, what's your end goal or something. And then it will um, create a prompt and it shows you what the prompt is. And it's usually like oh. seven sentences when mine would have been one. And that way it helps you hone down, hone in on the answer quickly. And so it's a really cool tool when you don't want, you know, you have a very specific issue and you don't want to type a lot or you're not quite sure how to frame it. So it's prompt, prompt perfect, not perfect prompt, right? Um, perfect. I had initially had it yeah. in there incorrect and somebody emailed me and told me that it's, um, it's prompt perfect. Prompt perfect. Was, yeah. yeah. And initially which, I which called it perfect. A lot of, a lot of lawyers are going to be quick to adopt that because they're going to think it's word perfect and they're going to be thrilled. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, all right. Gene, uh, do you want to add anything to that? I know you you had no, also had that. Yeah. Covered everything. I just added in my comment that the, all the prompt discussion reminded me of an old <laughs> Westlaw uh, iteration called "Win," which is Westlaw is natural, and it was to help <laughs> lawyers who didn't understand Boolean to construct Westlaw searches. <laughs> yeah, they basically yeah. had to fill out a form. <clears throat> yeah, I wonder if that was ethical. I don't know. Um, well, it, probably, I guess another kind of related story that several of us wrote about this week is the launch of this Liga, uh, and, and it's related in the sense that it uh, is a, an attempt to uh, uh, create a, uh, uh, provide a platform uh, for law firms to safely uh, deploy uh, uh, AI within their, within their organizations. Um, anybody want to? Talk about that a little bit or 
Yeah, I mean, I I, yeah, I'm one of the people that <laughs> wrote yeah. about it. Yeah. No, it actually seems pretty cool. It's like, um, so I mean, it's the platform is basically kind of like a sandbox environment, if you will, um, that lets people experiment with generative AI without all of these terrible consequences, which is, I think, pretty critical to the education aspect of what we've been talking about and what we need here, um, because it also creates audit trails. So if you get good results, if you're like you're creating tools, you're creating all this, you can figure out how to replicate it and scale it. But the whole idea is, you know, it was Christian Lang said himself, like people need to be able to experiment with these to learn them, but they need to be able to do it safely. Yeah. And this is Christian, who was just recently the president of, of, of Rain in court. Uh, and, and I don't know about anybody else, but when I when I first got on the call with him and he started talking about what he was doing, I kept thinking, this is raining court. This is raining court. <laughs> this is raining court for AI, basically. But it's not. I mean, it's no. it is different. But he did uh, it, address it in yeah, talking that yeah. yeah, he like he's drawing on his experience from that for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's similar in the sense that it is a platform designed to allow law firms to sort of take safely test. I mean, Rain Court was focused on allowing law firms sort of safely test and deploy cloud-based applications within their own controlled environments. And this is a, a platform for allowing law firms to sort of safely test large language models within a, a more controlled environment where they can set, set guardrails as everybody's calling it around it uh, and, and be able to track activity and what's happening and again, um, so there, in both, some similarity, yeah. yeah, and in both to do so without huge investment in one as a gamble, also, and to, to start yeah. out, yeah, 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 it's an interesting. I, I think it's an interesting idea, and yeah. uh, I mean, he, you know, launched with at least one name, Amlaw One Hundred Firm, already as a customer, and says there's yeah. others possibly in the works. So, uh, good for him, and uh, be interesting to follow. Um, uh, it, it, not to mention he launched with two, uh, you know, well-known uh, advisors in, in yep. uh, Haley Altman and, and Nicole Braddock as, as part of Wait, his group. Wait, who? So. Haley Altman, uh, what? No, I, yeah, <laughs> no. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, no. Um, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting <laughs> story. I, like, obviously, uh, it's, it's initial uh, value proposition being the kind of safe environment to test this stuff out. But, like, hey, the, it really is true that they, I, I think they have a, a pivot that they can get to uh, for having even more value down the road as people play with this more and understand more that figuring out the wisdom of the crowd, I, it's all weird to use the word wisdom while talking about a large group of associates. That word doesn't really usually go together, but uh, the wisdom of the crowd is going to be the real accelerator because you can you can figure out what people are doing in that sandbox that works. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm maybe jump off of a <laughs> jump off of AI for a second here. Only um, I'm going to talk about a story I did just because I thought it was I thought it was kind of interesting uh, this week. That next point. Uh, the uh, e-discovery company um, has launched a uh, a law firm uh, in under the under Arizona's uh, revised uh, 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 professional responsibility rules there, uh, and uh, it is uh, the first e-discovery company to launch a law firm of its own, as far as as far as I could tell. And I went through all the uh, I don't know, there are certainly none in none in Arizona uh, that are like this. Uh, and uh, it, it, it I, I, you know, I, it kind of got me thinking about why did it even take this long for somebody to do this? It, it's kind of a natural extension. I mean, next point is, is a little bit different than some of the e-discovery companies out there because it's always been kind of a combination of both technology platform and a services company to support the technology platform. Uh, but so now it has taken all of its its services uh, uh, part of its business and moved them over into this law firm, along with a group of lawyers who are experts in uh, e-discovery and 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 uh, other data issues around litigation. Uh, and now they can provide clients with kind of a full range of counseling um, 
uh, along, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the spectrum of, of issues that can come up in, 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 in using uh, e-discovery technology and performing e-discovery. Uh, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how they do that. I mean, how that does and, and, and what kind of success it has. I mean, it is kind of, it's pretty much tied to the product. I mean, I'd ask them whether they would be taking clients who aren't next point customers. And they said, well, they, they could, but it would be kind of, that wouldn't be the point because the point is really, they're all experts in, in next points technology. And that seems to make sense for them. Um, but, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about the uh, experiments in Utah and Arizona. And uh, this is a kind of another chapter in that in that experiment, uh, another extension of what can be done under these alternative business ownership rules that we're seeing come up. Yeah, I'm all for more, I mean, obviously, if they're thought out, good ideas, seeing more companies and more kinds of companies sort of push those rules and capitalize on the states that, you know, let them do it. Because we've all talked about, you know, UPL and whether the rules are too strict and what the outcomes are. So I'm curious to see how it goes. All right. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, what else did we want to talk about this week? Uh, the, uh, there was the little news that came out uh, last night uh, involving case point. Um, you know, not not the first time we've we've seen this kind of thing happen, but uh, I I think I think I think I saw you guys had an update today. They finally put out a statement on it, uh, Stephanie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They gave us a few paragraph statement. They've they've hired an all all side consultant, and they're looking into it, and it hasn't impacted anybody's access to the platform and their information on it. I mean, nothing. I mean, it was more than just uh we're working on it. It was at least more thoughtful, and it was prompt. But um, yeah, I mean. I wasn't, you know, I didn't, like I said, I think I said to you guys, I didn't have, you know, Russian ransomware cartels and the dark web on my legal tech bingo card for the week, but here we are. <laughs> you never know when those Russian cartels will <laughs> rear their ugly heads. Yeah. Well, and, and coincidentally, and I, I'm not sure if it's a coincidence or not, um, the university my kids go to and my husband also works at, um, sent an email out. It sounded like it just went to anybody who has any contact with the university, indicating that there had been a breach. They, along with 2,500 other companies, had a vendor that was breached, you know, a third-party vendor that handled information. They didn't say who it was, but, and so now you need to change all your passwords, check all your bank accounts, do all these other, you know, be extra vigilant. And it makes me wonder if um, it was, it touched that and if it was, if next point was the third-party vendor or not. So case point. if it wasn't, case, then there's some other case point. This case, case point. point's a law firm, case points. Sorry, next point. Yes, <laughs> prior to that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but it's I, yeah. I I can only imagine that every single uh customer is having to do that, even if that wasn't why I got that email. But you're seeing that happen like a ripple effect. But I mean, as far as the ransomware goes, obviously we weren't gonna go on the dark web to try to like look at this stuff, but I mean, if you look at the roster of clients that Case Point has, like there's a lot of potential valuable data in there. So it's not really a surprise that they would be a huge target. And I think more legal entities should maybe realize that they are. And I feel like a lot of this, like, like security breaches and hacks, we hear about those more, but like this sort of ransomware is, I don't know, just a little bit of it, not for them, but an interesting wrinkle on it. And I don't know. It's all very nefarious with black cat and dark web and yeah yeah there was the um i mean there were a couple of big ransomware attacks against uh e-discovery companies in the past where it really shut them down for a while so it's interesting yeah. that they say they're up and running uh this quickly it, it, I, I, either i i mean either they were you know very well prepared for it uh and were able to get back up and running or or they paid the ransomware or they paid the ransom rather but uh probably probably the former i would guess uh you know, this is a uh, a company that is has a lot of federal government uh, clients. Is FedRAMP certified? Uh, and state ramp, and, yeah. yeah. And so you have to assume they were. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to protect a ransomware entirely from a ransomware attack, but it's but it is uh, it's easier to be prepared to respond when it happens than than yeah. not to be. So. 
Um, what is anything else? Did we have anything else? Oh, you, Nikki, you want to talk about? Did you want to talk about all the all the uh, AI well, driven contract software in the world? I don't have to talk. I, I'll just link to the article and briefly like talk about why. Um, it's you know the things are changing so quickly. There's constantly new. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> um, there's constantly new software um, coming out that is, you know, claims to be chat GPT or GPT enabled um, or generative AI, you know, or some sort of combination of the generative AI tools that it is um, hard to keep track of it. And so um, what I did was I um, wrote a, I, I'm just part of what my ABA journal column does is I talk about a category of software each month. And I talk about a bunch of the different um, companies that um, develop that software and you know how to choose the right software. So this chat GPT and GPT powered software tools are a new category. And so um, contract analytics seems like a good one to focus on because there are a bunch of different companies coming out. So I essentially just covered that category of software. But <clears throat> as a side note, what I've started to find to be really helpful, um, I mentioned this last week, but I do, I'm starting to do this with my columns and stuff is um, whether it's legal tech news or Bob's site or you know I, the people that tend to cover all these releases um, now that there's plugins you can have chat GPT scrape the site and give you a list of all the ones that have been covered rather than you having to go through and me by you I mean me having to go through and manually try and locate all the ones that have been written about that I might have already missed or that I haven't been tracking so it's super helpful to use chat, chat GPT to write about chat GPT so it's starting to become that you know oh what was that movie um inception I'm starting to have like inception experiences here but that's okay <laughs> that's funny I said that on mute and then you heard me you're like right <laughs> Yeah. So um, it's a, it's a good example of a way to use it because if you can enter a website or a link and tell chat GPT to re review the content and then provide you with a list and it does, it provides you, these are, it, it misses some, but it gets two thirds of them, which is really helpful. And then you can go through and take a look at the um, actual products and decide whether they should be included or whether they're even on point, but it's a really useful way to use it as a journalist or if you're just otherwise tracking this space for other reasons. So. You mean you're checking your results? That's a novel thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I am. Look at there, trying to, and I'm find, trying to find the links and read about it, right? It is. It's, that's called think, extra book. <laughs> I think I mentioned this, but my, one of my sons has been working on a GPT interface to all of my blog content. So you'll be able to just do a, a query of, wow. you know, like the kind of query you're talking about and, and uh, get an answer uh, that kind of goes through everything I've written over the last 20 years and, and, and produces an answer. Uh, oh, that's it, really interesting. It's, it's in a little rough form right now. It, it's not, it doesn't always return the right result. It, it doesn't hallucinate. It's just not always complete. Uh, so uh, he, he's still working on it, but at some point he's, I'm going to put it out there for pe people to see and play around with. Yeah, definitely let, let me know, because I feel like above the laws search function is utterly terrible. I mean, so. I, I mean hold, hold, hold my beer, Joe. ALMs is horrendous. <laughs> I've got to be honest. I, well you know what? It's internally. interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, what's weird is I actually right. feel ALMs not that bad. Whenever I feel like I want to find an old ALM story in my memory banks, I can find it. But whenever I want to find something I wrote a month ago, I can't find it for the life of me. Have yeah. you tried going into WordPress and searching from there, Joe? I bet you're going to have a much Oh, that is such a disaster. No, uh, really? the only good way is Google uh, and to go to Google proper and look for the tag page. But all those tag pages, which other blogs got rid of years ago, don't uh, slow down your process and whatever, but they are the only thing that's useful for searching for us right now, which is terrible, but whatever. Yeah. Do you ever no. use the Google site site search or just go put in the site URL for above the law and then, then it's just using Google to search your site? I, I, you know, good point. I could do that. I just type above the law as all one word yeah, and it does yeah, not do give that, me yeah. the, it does right. not give me the Steven Seagal movie options. It just gives me my own, um, right. but yeah. There's a browser extension yeah. if you forget, I can never remember if there's a site colon pure, um, space or if it's site and then just a, you know, colon without a space. So there's a Google Chrome extension 
that you can just mm. click on that will just set it up properly for you. And you just enter the search term and it'll search the site for you. I'm all yeah, about yeah. extensions and add-ons and plugins. And yeah. You can just type <laughs> site I'd like colon, to point out that Boolean the URL. would solve some of these problems too, because you can say within five words of, you know. Yeah. I, I Remember how good Boolean was? Why did we get rid of this? <laughs> it works. There are times when it's useful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think what this shows though, what I think that generative AI, and I've said this before, does is it solves the information overload problem. Google's no longer good at that. There's so much information out there. There's so much advertising and spam that gets pulled up to the top because money's getting paid that you can't find anything useful. And for now, at least in this brief honeymoon period, chat GPT and generative AI, other tools like that solve the problem. And I also just use, depending on what I'm trying to find, one of those three tools, Bard, Bing, or chat GPT. And I usually find what I'm looking for way more quickly than if I'd Googled it. So yeah. the sad so, commentary on where we are, I feel like as a society. So <laughs> to, to, to your point about the uh, numbers of uh, contract tools using GPT, uh, I, I, again, I, I wasn't at clock. I know Stephanie was, but my, my son, my other son was not the one who was working on that, but my other oh. son was there and he went around and he recorded, just sort of randomly recorded interviews of people in the exhibit hall. I don't know how randomly it was. He said it was random, but uh, he got like 22 interviews and we stitched them all together into an episode of my podcast this week. And I was listening to it thinking, oh my God, this is just like, it's just one contract generative AI oh. thing after another, after another, after another. It's like, how do I, and, and, and then, and he can't, and I, one of the things he would ask them, well, how do you differentiate themselves? And they'd all like give the same answer for how they differentiate oh, themselves. My, yeah, my my article on clock takeaways, one of the subheads was CLM plus AI colon everything everywhere all at once. It's all yeah. it was. I love yeah. that. Yeah. That's awesome. See, see, that's fingers. a more modern reference. One of my bet, one of my stories today, I used a movie reference. And I really feel like the story didn't perform well because it was too old of a reference. Uh, so everything everywhere all at once is a better, you did better than me. Well, thanks. Hey, I, I'll, I'll write that down, everybody. That is a moment in yeah. time that Joe said that. Because <laughs> I, I put a, I, I have a story with a Spaceballs reference in the headline today. And I kind of feel like it didn't do well because people don't know what Spaceballs is. Well, yeah. that's more of a commentary on people than on you, Joe. I will give it that. Thank you. <laughs> For that, my clock really podcast, I used clock in a box and nobody seemed to get that either. Oh, I enjoyed that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when you work with like millennials or like my Gen Z kids. And I talk to them, I'll go things that make you go, hmm. And they all look at me. I'm like, oh God, forget about it. Like I won't even like, they don't get the pop culture references. You guys don't even get it. Does anyone remember that song? Things oh that yeah. Make no. all right. Yeah. CNC Music Factory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like you date yeah. yourself so badly with your pop culture reference. I do. I shouldn't speak for everybody. Yeah. So if people weren't following the DeSantis Disney case that's been going on, the most recent development is that the judge recused himself. He he denied the disqualification motion, but granted a disqualification in himself that he did sua sponte because he found out a third degree relative had 30 shares of Disney stock. And so I put in my headline the whole like space balls, like my father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. And yeah, or you just could have did, said, people didn't take it. You could have said six degrees of separation or whatever it was. <laughs> that's old. That's an older reference. All right. That's when like, that's like when the fresh, when the, that's pre fresh Prince Will Smith. <laughs> uh oh. All right. Oh, buddy. All right. Well, unless we want to talk about the uh, succession finale or the uh, Ted Lasso finale or something, we may have to just wrap it up here. I don't think we have anything else to talk about this week. Do we? Anything, I mean, there's anything the else Yellow we Jackets finale too. We have all these shows. Oh, ending. okay, okay. Well, we can do a whole episode. <laughs> about next all week, those, we'll but... be talking about the end of <laughs> the end of HBO shows. <laughs> Wait, no. Of course, it's the end of HBO shows. They're called Max, Max. now because that's <laughs> that's brilliant corporate decision making. That was the dumbest oh, Yes. <laughs> Let me ask how to copy the chat. Can I select it, but not copy? You know, I, I try and I, I do record the chat uh, and it took me a while to actually figure out how to do that, but I do record the chat and I do get a file uh, which I could probably make available to people uh, after the fact. It doesn't, 
when we put the video on YouTube, it does not include the chat. The video does go up on YouTube uh, every week after we're done. Uh, but uh, if if people want to email me, ambrogi at gmail.com or something, if they want the chat, uh, happy to send it out to people. All right. See, people really just come for the chat, not for us. We knew that. All right, I think that's it for today. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll be back next week. Hopefully we can, maybe we'll be able to talk more about uh, what sanctions were imposed on uh, on, on these poor uh, bogus cases lawyers. Is it, and, is it uh, actually, sorry, a procedural question I don't know. Like, is the decision announced right at a sanctions hearing like that? No, probably not. Uh, probably I, take, just, I assume probably, not, but. I mean, they, he, they could if they wanted to, a judge yeah. could, nothing precludes them, but they're, they'll, they'll, Probably they might even brief it probably and whatever yeah. it would probably take forever that's, before they decide it. Yeah. yeah, I assumed, but but there was the judge also said with regard to one of the lawyers that he was also going to ask him to show cause as to why he should not be referred for a disciplinary referral or a disciplinary uh, investigation. Yeah. Um, and I mean, who knows? That might be the kind of thing he would just do. Uh, sua sponte, as they yeah. say. I mean, I yeah. would be surprised if there was not a disciplinary investigation of some kind in this case. And I wouldn't uh, be surprised if there's another case next week about the same thing. <laughs> well, oh yeah, agreed, agreed, yeah. Gene. Yeah. I you, I looked. Did you look at anybody look at that lawyer's uh, LinkedIn profile by chance? Yeah. He had a big thing on right under his right at the top of his profile saying "We're hiring." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are going to want to apply there right now. Uh, <laughs> Well, now you also have the judges saying, you know, you have to sign the certifications of whether or not you used AI. This is a whole. I think okay. I really that's... just wanted that reaction from Joe. I was just going for that. So I, I my it's work is done. Ridiculous. It's just, it's the same ridiculous grandstanding bull that like, yeah. And of course that judge, because that judge is, I'm not even sure that judge is a lawyer, is he? Um, <laughs> like, I know that, look, I, I'm being absolutely serious. I'm not sure he actually still has a has a bar li license. I think there's some reason to question that. I, but maybe he does. <laughs> but um, but there's there's some I've heard some people say that he actually let it last, which is fine. I think I don't think there's a rule that you have to be a lawyer. But yeah. Well, it's just ridiculous. It's the same old knee jerk reaction you see the technology. You know, this happens all the time. There's all, you know, they're initially going to require like affidavits that you didn't use it. And eventually they're going to um, do like what they did with email. Oh, you need to get your clients, um, you need to get your clients consent, you, you know, you or you can't use it or and then they're all like, oh, we give up. Like they're just going to give up because it's going to be like this tidal wave of change that they can't can no longer nitpick whether someone did or didn't use it and they're going to and and so i think and especially when all the legal products are rolling it in there you're not using chat gpt but how do you even define generative ai and how do you even know if the legal product is necessarily using gpt powered or some other generative ai and it just i don't know they can't nitpick it enough to even make it useful they're just going to do this in the beginning, just like the universities are doing it. It's stupid. I read about one professor and then I, one professor, what they did was they actually helped the class figure out how they could use it and how it did and didn't work for what they were trying to do. Teach them, show exactly. them that it doesn't give you, you know, the results that you necessarily want. Teach them how to critically think about it. Don't just ban it with this knee jerk reaction. Same with the courts. Yeah. Okay. Well, so both, both to... of your reactions were exactly what I wanted when I mentioned this. So yay. <laughs> to cl to close the loop on that one, uh, that judge uh, is inactive. He has stopped taking CLEs and everything. So he he was a lawyer, but he is inactive and query whether or not it's cool that judges not keep their law licenses up, not do the CLE that they're supposed to do under their state bar. That's a whole other question. No, it's Texas, That's right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, Texas, I mean, they, their attorney general is going to end up in prison at this rate. So who knows? Apologies to anyone in the audience from Texas. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> but he does get to the shooting range every weekend. So that's a good thing. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think that does it for this week. Nikki, have a very happy birthday this weekend. Yes, and we'll birthday. see you all back here again next Friday. Great. Mm -hmm. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye, all.
Bye. Bye.